Welcome to this podcast brought to you by the Vatican Observatory Foundation. I'm your host, Bob Tremblay. I'm a volunteer NASA JPL Solar System Ambassador, the president of Michigan's Warren Astronomical Society, and an internet factotum for the Vatican Observatory Foundation. This podcast comes from a recording of one of our monthly full moon meetups with the Vatican Observatory staff and Sacred Space Astronomy subscribers. Sacred Space Astronomy is the Vatican Observatory's online community. We have several astronomers and scholars who write articles on our website about astronomy, space science, and faith in science. Every full moon, the Vatican Observatory Foundation hosts a Zoom meetup for our Sacred Space Astronomy subscribers. Typically, our guest will be a member of the Vatican Observatory staff or an affiliated researcher, and they'll tell us about the research they're doing and the journey that led them to the Vatican Observatory. Brother Guy Consolmagno, director of the Vatican Observatory and president of the Vatican Observatory Foundation, will typically talk with our guests and our Sacred Space Astronomy subscribers can ask them questions. This podcast was taken from the Full Moon Meetup on Tuesday, November 8, 2022. Our guest was Deirdre Kelligan. She's an astronomer, astronomical artist, and educator doing an extraordinary amount of public outreach. And she's a Sacred Space Astronomy author, too. I'd like to now introduce our guest for this week, or this month, this month, Deirdre Kelligan. Hi. Um, I understand that there is a new star in your orbit this weekend. Can you tell us a little bit about that? I had a new grandson, my second grandchild, and uh, he's absolutely gorgeous. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, we, we, we've been to see him and we're going up again on this weekend, I think. Uh, he's not well. He's got jaundice, but um, he's recovering, you know, every day a little bit better. The sun is helping him. Mm-hmm. So he's already feeling the benefit of our star <laughs> uh, in the window, you know, just in his in his nappy or diaper, as you say in America, so that the sun light is on him, but not necessarily hot. You know what I mean? It must be just a property in the light that uh, breaks down the bilirubin in the liver, which causes jaundice. So. He's benefiting from the sun, Excellent. which I, in the first few days of his life, which I think is incredible, you know? Yeah. Really incredible. Yeah. <laughs> so, so where are you right now at the moment? I'm in a place called Killadoon, which is halfway to Boston because I'm right on the edge of the Atlantic here. Um, it's about 10 kilometers from Louisburg which is a, a great little village, really tiny, but it has everything in it. Westport would be our nearest town. Are you north or south of Westport? We're uh, uh, southwest, <laughs> southwest, okay. southwest right. of Westport. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right, very close. We're very close to the sea. Mm-hmm. We can see Clare Island. Yeah. I don't know whether you noticed Clare Island when you were here on the oh, weekend. Yeah. It was probably yeah. in fog. <laughs> it's usually it's usually in fog. Yeah, we can, Clare Island. We can see Clare Island from from mm-hmm. our house directly. It's right. seven kilometers and, away. And those of us with any Irish in our background, Westport was the port that most of the immigrants left when they were fleeing the famine. Mm-hmm. And there's mm-hmm. a monument there to that. Yeah, the whole so, landscape here is a monument to the famine yeah. because the people were dependent on the potato. And so they had the they had the potatoes in drills, you know, like kind of bumps in the landscape where they, you know, planted them. And you can still to this day, even I, I can look out the window here and see the fields like that, in mm-hmm. like, like kind of green grass waves. And they're on right. the most ridiculous angles, like forty five degree angles up a mountain. <laughs> Some poor person was growing potatoes and harvesting potatoes to try and live. And then, of course, all the, the blight, potato blight, um, damaged the potatoes. And so their their fundamental source of food was was gone. I, I You know, they, they must have had some fish or something like that because we're so close to the sea here, but their basic staple was gone. It was a very difficult time. But uh, it always um, it's very remarkable to see that in the landscape still today, the, like the history carved into the landscape yeah well the re- reason i was there is the area north of mayo including the the national park there has been designated a dark sky site yeah and i'm told when they were first sending the readings back to the dark sky association in tucson they were getting uh questions are you sure your meter is turned on <laughs> they couldn't believe how dark the skies were there 
Yeah, yeah. The skies here, uh, I'm on the other side of the bay, but um, uh, the nearest house is uh, about 500, 600 metres away. Their light doesn't bother me that much, but when you get a dark sky here, there's nights when you just, there's so many stars, you, you can hardly recognise the constellations within them. You know, that kind of a night, <laughs> it's tactile, It's you could, you, you could touch it. And and this winter, my, one of my plans was to do more uh, naked eye drawings of the sky, like up the Milky Way, and you know, realizing how enormous it is. I know the task will have to be done in sections and maybe overlapped or connected together at some point. But uh, that hasn't happened because nearly every day in October it's been raining. Yeah. <laughs> so um, hopefully, now that the clock has changed. It'll be dark earlier. Uh, maybe I'll get away with it, you know, right. at some point. That, that's the plan anyway. Well, this brings up, of course, one of the things that you're famous for, one of the reasons I wanted to bring you on here, which is your drawings of objects as seen through a telescope. Yeah. I remember yeah. Uh, 2009 when we first met, you were talking about doing a project of trying to reproduce the drawings that Galileo had done. Ah, uh, yeah. I, I actually did do that on a three foot by three foot canvas. Each of the, you know, there were reproductions from Sidereus Nuncius and mm -hmm. each of the moons were 13 inches in diameter. And it looked great when it was, fin it was finished and the guy bought it um, for his <laughs> house. <laughs> uh, but it, you know, he was another astronomer, so he knew what it was. Where a lot of the, the ones that I paint it would take an astronomer to know what they were, where your regular person wouldn't know, because I do a lot of paintings of the surfaces of other worlds, you know, like mm -hmm. Mars and uh, Europa and other things like that. Um, how did you my, How did you get started? What What got I, you started in doing this sort of artwork? The, the astronomical drawing, I can tell you yeah. exactly how I got started in that, because it all came about in and around between 2004 and 2008, a whole bunch of stuff that's always been in my life, like drawing, writing, speaking about stuff, especially as astronomy, um, astronomical drawing and drawing. The whole ball of wax came together really in 2004, very strongly, because, you know, I had three children myself and they were teenagers. So I had a bit of time to myself. I had gone back to college in around 2001 for to learn how to use a computer and to learn how to type and to learn all that kind of basic stuff. In that particular course, we had to give a, a talk about something that you were passionate about. So I gave a talk about the Milky Way and the other people in the room, you know, there was silence because they nobody expected me to talk about the Milky Way, you know, like a, a mother coming out of having children and getting her, getting her head back together. Um, and I loved it. And I realized I really, really loved it at that moment. And I made a decision to finish. When I finished that course, I went to UCD and did communications. That's University College in Dublin. And I there was nine modules in that, I think, over two years. And I did every single one of them based on an astronomical subject, one or the other. Then I, I was interested in space as well. And I came across this DVD that was being offered for people who were interested in this, the Cassini mission to Saturn. So I, I sent off for it. And this lady who actually comes from near Pasadena, Monrovia, she was the uh, Jane Houston Jones is her name. And she was the outreach specialist for the Cassini mission to Saturn. And she sent me the disc and we kind of became friends, you know, because she told me that she did astronomical drawing. And I kind of said to myself, well, I love drawing. And I had a telescope, but it wasn't very good. So I bought a, a little tiny telescope called an EXT-70. You know, it had tracking. It was the only one of my telescopes that ever had tracking. But um, it was only a small little thing. But I began to do some drawing. And then I'd send her, her my drawings. And she sent me her drawings. And I kind of was going, this is amazing. I didn't know people did astronomical drawing, you know, like after the, uh, you know, the camera was invented, uh, I suppose it went into decline. It wasn't exactly 
popular, <laughs> you know. So I, I got into that. It, it started a whole series of things, which I kind of call yes. A lot of people said yes to me, which was amazing. Like I went out to Dunsink Observatory with that disc and I was doing Again, communications. That, that's, that's the observatory outside of Dublin, right? Yeah, just outside Dublin. I went out there with the disc on one of their public nights and I spoke to another lady called Hilary O'Donnell who was running the um, public nights, you know, who would, who was going to speak. And, and I said to her, I'd love to play this disc for your audience and tell them about it, tell them about the mission and what I knew about it. And she said yes. <laughs> you know, <laughs> like Jane said yes by sending me the DVD in the first place. Hilary said yes. I have no idea why she said yes, because she didn't know me or anything like that. So in I went to the observatory and it was full of people, um, put on the disc, told them what I was going to do, and they loved it. Then another person said yes, um, who connected me up with a school in Greystones, which was near my house at the time. And off I went down to Greystones with my laptop, a projector that I had borrowed from the Irish Astronomical Society. I had been writing for them for about, I don't know, six or seven months. And I, I never went into any of their meetings until I rocked up one night and I said, I'm doing a thing in Greystones for kids in the school. Can I borrow your projector? Yes, they said. <laughs> and off I went with their projector. They only knew me from writing a few bits from articles for their magazine. They didn't really know me, but off I went with the projector in my car. <laughs> and then a couple of days later into the school, set up the thing and my, a friend of mine ran up the road and got her son's speakers and we connected the whole shebang together and 120 kids came in to watch Ringworld projected on their kind of uh, blinds, white blinds they had on the big windows in the school. Luckily it wasn't a sunny day so the image was quite good and they started you know kind of dancing in their seats to the music that was on it and enjoying the mission and the you know the content of the disc was very good quality I had to have more of that I had to I wanted to do it you know what I mean I was completely driven <laughs> but then I was supported as well you know by people saying yes by then Jane sending me you know bookmarks and stickers and moon cards and all that kind of stuff which was just brilliant but there was a whole series of things that kind of came together in a parallel way. Like I got really into astronomical drawing big time. I got into the materials. I started with pencil and then I got into the materials that I absolutely adore working with, which is pastels. I've, I've drawn in pastel or chalk since I was four years old. My mother kept some of my drawings and I still have some of them. So when I got into my own materials, drawing with pencil on a white piece of paper didn't do it for me because I wasn't looking at uh, like a grey image on a white page. I was looking through the telescope on a black night with a nebula in it, which was grey and grey and grey and many shades of grey with the odd star and whatever. And when I looked at the moon, that was many, many shades of grey with very, very distinct white, bright and very extremely distinct blacks. And that's, I absolutely adore that, the Terminator or you know, the way the shadows formed in craters because of the sun was rising or setting, you know, and the way that moved in front of my eyes in the time I was looking. You know, then you have the dilemma, will I finish it now or will I add more? It always, it always came to me the right time to stop. Um, well, this brings up a really fascinating question then, because you reproduced mm -hmm. the Galileo images. What did you learn about what Galileo must have done? Because yeah. uh, first of all, I guess he used he used watercolor, right? I I use in the in my reproduction I used acrylics on canvas. Okay. Um, I'm not really sure what he used. Maybe it was charcoal or something. I don't know. And you know the photographs; I mean, could, they're very. Um, they look like they were etchings for the print or something, don't they? They've got mm -hmm. like a yeah. load of tiny lines. Like, I don't know how he would have drawn those tiny ah. lines. So we don't know what the originals were because they were reproduced. Uh, maybe, yeah. Yeah, yeah, re books. yeah. yeah, maybe. Yeah. Maybe he could have used some sort of Conte or mm -hmm. some sort of, right. uh, 
you know it's very well, hard to tell like it could mm-hmm. be like a sepia thing you know mm-hmm. yeah well so how long do you think uh, each picture took him given the fact that the moon is constantly changing uh, how, how uh, that's a good question too I, and his telescope was very small, you know, so the right. detail that was available to him was an awful lot less than what's in my eight inch job, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, so I, I, oh gosh, that's a very hard question. I, I, I would still think he probably spent an hour. Okay. Before you put a, a mark down on a page when you're drawing the moon, you have to look at the whole thing in context. And I learned that I had to do a, a base background in gray. I usually use a, a, like a, a plate, depending on the moon phase or whatever. I would just use the, the curved edge of either a, a dinner plate or a side plate. Depending on, it depended on lots of things like the weather, the position of the moon, whether it was going to go behind a tree or a building or whatever, how much could I get done? And if I, if, if I was going to have two and a half hours of clear sky, with the moon nice and high, then I went for it. I did the bigger, the bigger size. But then you had to do a balance by, like, say, starting maybe with some very distinctive crater. If you're doing a full phase drawing, just get the shape kind of right and then move on and do little pieces of everything and then go back to the Terminator and then keep going back and, you know, building it mm. up. Because you could very easily be going nuts doing one little section and then mm-hmm. the clouds will come and you're not you haven't got anything else to show for all your efforts, you know. But if you're deep into a crater or whatever, then you can go mad because it, it it's filling your eyepiece and you mm. can that's all your focus. You're not trying to balance everything in. What what does it do for you? What do you learn by drawing the object rather than just looking at it or uh, taking a photograph of it? What do you learn? Yeah, what, what what's do the emotional? I learn? What's yeah. the emotion? Oh, the emotion is enormous, especially for drawings that are connected or are near enough to the Terminator. It's just the light. And you know it's the edge of a crater or you know it's a mountaintop. You, you, you even kind of try to imagine what it's like to be there as the sun comes over you. You know, if you're sitting on the edge of that mountain or the edge of the crater. It's just the most beautiful. Like, the things that I really, really, really enjoy drawing the most are comets. If I can get myself lashed onto a comet, and the reason is they change so much in short periods of time, like, say, Comet Holmes, 17P Holmes there, I think it was 2017. I mean, that was astonishing. That really had my jaw on the floor because of the, the changes in its shape even within the space of a few hours. The moon changes maybe to my eye every 10 minutes. You know, you can see a change as the sun is, you know, cruising over the the landscape. But with the comets, because they change so dramatically and they move across the sky, with Comet Homes in particular, you know, it was kind of like an expanding Alka-Seltzer in a glass. You know, it was coming (laughs) at you, but maintaining its circular shape from the material, the ejecta stuff coming out of it. But then I did a drawing, uh, I did about 28 drawings, I think, of Comet Homes. And one of them had spokes in it, three spokes in it. And I looked at it and, and to me, it looked like a wheel. And I had this this feeling that it was spinning, but I didn't know if it was. But I did a few days later when other uh, astrophotographers around the world went, it's spinning, you know, and they had it in there. They had it, uh, you know, up online all over the place. And I was kind of going, I saw that in a drawing, you know, but I didn't know. Mm-hmm. I couldn't put put a spinning thing on it. <laughs> One of the things you, you gave us at the Vatican Observatory A drawing you did, I think, of uh, a sunspot cluster. Yeah, if I remember uh, correctly, an an active region. Yeah, a very active region. A very active region. Yeah, and and um, that was um, a pencil drawing. I actually got quite late into solar drawing. Uh, I got a PST forty telescope for my fiftieth birthday, which was fifteen years ago. When I looked at the sun in that. I kind of went to myself, oh, my God, I mean, the 40 millimeter objective and then your solar image is even smaller, you know, 
And there is a ridiculous amount of detail on it, especially if you've got an active region and you've got some filaments. Then you have all those dots all over the sun, you know, that, that matrix of fibrils, the shapes that they go into that are governed by the magnetic activity. How do you draw that? There's no point in drawing it when at 40 or 20 millimetres. I tend to draw, use a plate again. I use a dinner plate if, if I've got a good thing going on. But I, I had to invent a way to draw the sun. For drawing the sun in colour, for drawing it as it is looking in the H-alpha with all the, the oranges, the greys, the dots, the everything. Um, I developed a technique by grating soft pastel into powder and then layering it and then etching away at it to get in the, the umbra and the penumbra and, and all that kind of stuff. But on the drawing I gave you, the pencil drawing, I did a few drawings because it is quite difficult to do the pastel drawings. They're vulnerable and they're difficult, but they do give a very good result. With the pencil drawing, I could see everything in the PST, all the, the way the layers looked. And I drew that in pencil because I was able to draw everything in with the one instrument, yeah, with the pencil. I, I kind of, I, I almost got more detail. That's all I can tell you. The thing that struck me is that I went online and found an image of the very same region, you know, photographic oh, yeah. image from a professional yeah. telescope. Yeah. You can see more detail in your drawing than you can in the photographic image. And I oh, think it's I because because it's gone through the human eye and uh, yeah. you're, you're eliminating the thing that, okay, that's not the interesting part. I'm going to emphasize the interesting part. Yeah, and I don't know whether the people who take the photographs you're talking about are looking at what they're taking. They could be yeah. uh, connected up to a, a computer and their eyeball isn't seeing the thing. You well, know? I'm sure that's the case. Yeah. Yeah. So, so how can that be accurate? They're obviously they're seeking uh, data or information or something they're interested in, like a light bridge or you know something specific in there that they want to develop the picture to show. Where I'm just looking and drawing as I see it, mm -hmm. and and sometimes you know if you're lucky enough, you'd get um, a half decent day, and you could do maybe two or three white light drawings of, a, of an active region and you'd see the changes. It could be very yeah. subtle changes or they could be dramatic depending or if it, if it was like to do with a prominence or something like that and I was doing that in pastel then that, that can be very dramatic and I've done that and I've made some of them into little videos because it is so dramatic what can happen with the sun sometimes you see nothing you know, but you have to draw your uh, your your prominence or or mm -hmm. or your filament or your filiprom, which are even <laughs> quite more, more interesting, and then walk away, have a cup right. of tea, ha have a piece of toast, something, come back twenty minutes later, draw the same thing. It's different. It would, mm -hmm. you know, if it's a dramatic one, if it's one of these ones that's going to take off and and come come towards us or whatever. And then, you, 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 you know, you, you, you'll eventually get a sequence, like an animation. Yeah. Mm -hmm. there's, there's a number of comments that are in the, uh, in the written comments about oh. how the human eye is, is such an excellent sensor and very unusual sensor. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. And, and for the benefit of the recording. Uh, so, Mark Olson, can you tell us what you were saying and Paul and Larry about the human eye? So the eye is more broadly sensitive to different wavelengths. One of the things I was looking at was with the early, especially the early photographs, daguerreotype sweat plate, you know, it's very narrow sensitivity band, mostly towards the blue, but that was a, a completely true image. So there wasn't any, any pre you know, object preconceptions. You couldn't, it was hard to fake. They were only getting that very narrow band right. of, of information. Whereas what a lot of times they could do was superimpose the two the photograph and the the drawing and it it really helped out with with the scientific study because you know no two drawings are ever going to be alike because no you know what the what each person what, what each artist sees when they draw it is is going to be different but the camera just shows that one thing but it isn't as deep as what what the human eye could actually see and paul you were mentioning about the human eye yeah, it's just a very uh, simple observation that uh, 
uh, we actually design cameras to have a linear re response. So if something is twice as bright in the picture, it will show twice as bright. But uh, the eye doesn't perceive things that way at all. It's uh, more um, like um, a logarithmic sensor. That is to say, it can perceive um, various orders of magnitude um, and adjust for it. So the psychological way we process images is really much more complex and allows us to go from a wide range of you know, extremely bright to extremely faint things in the same perception, which, of course, a camera can't do. It's really quite extraordinary what you can do with an eye. <laughs> right. and, and Larry, you had a comment? Yeah, I mean, basically, you know, when you do something with adaptive optics, you're taking lots and lots of very, very short images and you're getting rid of a lot of the blurriness from even a quarter of a second or a half a second exposure in the eye. Again, when you're looking at it, you go, oh, look, it's clear this instant. And then you can draw that where if you were to integrate it over a second, it would be horrible or not as good. It would be blurry. Yeah. The one other thing that I can see that drawing does for you, maybe this is just me. Um, when I'm out with my telescope and I'll look at oh, the Orion Nebula, let's say, and I go, oh, wow, now what do I want to look at? Because I don't have the patience to keep looking at it. But if I gave yeah. myself the task of drawing it, then I would continue to look at it and begin to see things that I might not have noticed if I were just looking at it once and saying, well, that's cool. What's the next thing on the list? <laughs> Yeah, I uh, once saw the Orion Nebula, the best I've ever seen it, um, in County Cavan one time. And, you know, in, in the, the nebulous part of it, in the grey cloud, I could see what looked like cracks in it, like little little lines, which I'd never seen before. It was just unbelievable. And I went inside to get my stuff to draw it, and I came out, and it was completely foggy. Oh, no. <laughs> and, the, and the fog didn't lift for the whole night. And then uh, another kind of failed attempt, which I'd love to try again, was um, I was down at a star party in Burr, and uh, a chap had uh, a friend of mine had a, a twenty-inch obsession telescope, and and there was a queue, huge queue of people wanting to see the Whirlpool Galaxy. Who doesn't want to see the Whirlpool Galaxy in Burr? Because <laughs> Burr uh, was where it was first recognized yeah, as the Whirlpool. Exactly, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So he said to me, um, I, he said, how, how long do you want? You know, I said, I'd love to draw it, you know. And I actually wanted about an hour and a half, maybe two hours. You know? <laughs> <laughs> he said, I'll give you 20 minutes. <laughs> I was kind of going, oh, gee. So up I went up the ladder to to look at the whirlpool in, in the obsession. And it was magnificent. It was absolutely edible. <laughs> and um, I got going with the drawing anyway. But a whole bunch of guys were kind of waiting and they were hanging on the legs of the ladder and moving it. <laughs> and I was, all I wanted just to do was just settle my head into it and pull it onto the page, mm -hmm. you know, in the in the best detail that I could possibly do, because I could see loads of detail, even though I, you know, I was only looking at it for a few minutes. So I got the, I got the sketch, but then I had to give up my place for the mm -hmm. people to look, you know. But uh, that's something I'd love to revisit and actually in a 20 inch or in a bigger telescope and just do it you know just do the best I can with it yeah it'd be what, amazing to look at it in the actual leviathan but that's not yeah. functioning properly right yeah the, the leviathan was you know in in Burr and that's the the largest telescope in the world from the 1840s until the uh, 1918 there was a slightly larger one built in Canada which had the record for about three months and then the 100 inch that yeah, uh, wow. Katie works with. Oh yeah, wow, 100 inch, wow, that Mount Wilson, yeah. Yeah, Mount Wilson. Yeah. Um, the, you, had a, you had a phrase, you know, it was edible. Yeah. And it reminds me of the, the last thing I wanna ask you about the work you're doing with school children. Oh yeah, yeah. And that project you had called Wicked Moons because oh. kids have the great, big, greatest way of describing what they're seeing. How did you get involved with uh, working with kids? What's the kind of support you've gotten from the Europeans? And I, uh, what yeah. have you learned from the kids? I, I, I recently did something with young scouts. They're called beavers. They're only six or seven. And at the age of six or seven, 
I was doing Deadly Moons, um, Deadly which moons, I, hadn't done, I hadn't done for Deadly a long moons, time. Right. Deadly Moons. Right. And so I showed a, a variety of moons, but they, they love anything, you know, that has an exploding ocean, anything that has exploding volcanoes. Um, but the, the, the really young ones, the six and seven year olds, they just love a smelly moon. So <laughs> Titan was was their their thing. And they all went nuts for Titan. Um, and what, you know, how smelly is it? And then you got all kinds of um, bodily function <laughs> smells. Come, <laughs> they were speaking about <laughs> out loud and they just were laughing and drawing Titan and they were delighted with themselves. But uh, so, yeah, I, uh, <laughs> I got so, into so, so. <laughs> Well, yeah, where did, where does well, the phrase "deadly" come from? I remind me. That's uh, that's why. Uh, yeah, I, this I was the, I came up with that that workshop in two thousand and eight. Uh, I lived near Dublin at the time. Well, you know, Bray, which is on the border of Wicklow and Dublin, and every kid said "deadly" about absolutely everything that they loved. Like, <laughs> if a TV program was brilliant, they would say it was deadly. If somebody's T-shirt was gorgeous, they'd say it was deadly. It was just a slang word. Absolutely everything that they liked was deadly. They would never say they liked something. They'd say it was deadly. So it was part of everyday conversation with children, with everybody, even adults. With, I would even say something was deadly, you know. So I don't know what they say now these days. I was trying to ask the kids there a couple of weeks ago, what, what do you say when something is wonderful? And they kept saying, "Oh, cool," <laughs> you know. And oh, I mean, even to me, even, but even to me, cool is old, you know. Um, and then a couple of years ago, I, I asked kids, "What what do you say when something is wonderful?" And he said the word "sick" <laughs> was was the cool thing. You know, it's kind of like mm. the opposite of what you might think, you know. Um, but I'm not sure whether deadly is part of the conversation these days so that's why mm -hmm. i was trying to find um another uh word that is in everyday children's conversation to to change the title again i've uh, recently made a video I, I was surprised by the number of people who still wanted online things recently so i made a video called let's draw our moon it, it could be for anybody because i think people when they look up at the moon, most people, adults, children, you name it, they go, oh, God, that's gorgeous. Isn't it lovely? Isn't the light lovely and all that kind of thing? But they wouldn't be able to tell you what they're looking at. They wouldn't be able to say what the dark areas are and what the bright areas are, anything at all about us, you know. They just admire it. So I kind of went, well, if people don't have a telescope or they don't have binoculars, if, if I got them to draw the dark areas, the moon itself, and I, um, I've named a few of the Marias and one crater, Tycho, and mentioned Apollo 11 landing and mentioned the Artemis upcoming landing at some point. Um, that should be enough. So I have yet to see how that goes because it's not out yet. But it, it, it's going to be part of the Mayo Science and Technology Festival. Yeah, the 18th and 19th of November. And so, certainly in, in the announcement of this and I'm sure when we put up the this as a uh, as a podcast, we will list the websites, the addresses where people can get yeah. uh, more information about you, the kind of equipment you use, the sure. things you've put online to, to teach people how to do this. And yeah. of course, you write for our sacred space, which I is do. Wonderful. And I enjoy writing. I've always enjoyed writing. And um, that's another thing, because you asked me to do that. So that was kind of you saying yes. Yeah. Yeah. And well, you asked me a few years ago. Um, or you organized Dan Davis drawings for a sketch and exhibition that I put together in 2009. That and was so the you, year of astronomy, yeah. It was. That was a very busy year. Yeah, yeah, very busy. Right. And that was when I first came to Ireland and uh, went to Black Rock Castle, which is the astronomy center outside of Cork. That's right. You you went down. I think I went down there with you. Um, yeah, yeah. And you walked around the exhibition and had to look at everybody's work. Um, so Patrick Moore actually gave me some of his drawings for to put in that exhibition, which I was amazed about. But I think mm -hmm. the most amazing thing, I think, was it was in the Burr Castle in the Science Gallery there. This was like an exhibition from amateur astronomers all over the world doing different kinds of drawings that I put together. And I asked um, the present Earl of Ross, the seventh Earl of Ross, would he possibly frame the Whirlpool Galaxy 
and put it in the exhibition. I, you know, I mean, I was chanting my arm, but he actually said yes. He was another uh-huh. yes. And he framed the Whirlpool Galaxy and the Crab Nebula that were done by the third Earl of Ross's ancient, ancient uh, relative and put them on the wall. <laughs> and so these date from the 1860s, right? Something yeah, like yeah, yeah. I couldn't believe it. I was absolutely astonished. And I think the people who put their work in the exhibition, who posted their work for the exhibition, were delighted to have their work, along with Dan Davis, along with Patrick Moore and the third Earl of Ross. I mean, you couldn't make it up, could you? No. <laughs> you know, uh, yeah. One, one of the things, just to tell people about the Leviathan, this giant uh, telescope, the mirror was the same size as the Vatican's. It was a 72-inch mirror. Yes, yeah, incredible. Six mirror. Yeah. And it's in a very long tube that can only point due south to straight overhead. And it was lifted between two walls and you can move it a few degrees in one direction or the other, but that's it. Yeah. Now, yeah. if anyone knows where the whirlpool is, it's just off the handle of the Big Dipper or the plow, as you would say. And most of us think of that as a constellation to the north. The telescope that could only look south or straight to straight up was able to see it, which tells you how far north we are <laughs> here in Ireland. Yeah. yeah. The yeah. Uh, the mirror also is not glass. It was uh, speculum metal, which is an alloy. And every time you polished it, it would change the uh, focal length and the characteristics of the lens or the wow. of the mirror, rather. Let me ask you one last question to finish off for the podcast. What are your future plans? What are my future plans? On Saturday morning, I'm doing uh, two online workshops for Westmead Libraries, Deadly Moons and the Magical Story of Stars. Next Tuesday and Wednesday, I'm doing in person, which doesn't happen that often these days, in person in Westport Library, uh, Deadly Moons, believe it or not, Deadly Moons Rides Again (laughs) uh, for two school groups that are coming in. And thankfully, I still have a bunch of uh, lovely moon cards from Jane that she sent me um, a long time ago to to give away to those kids. Um, And I'm looking forward to seeing what kind of drawings they make. And I do want to do naked eye Milky Way drawings, some more moon drawings. That would be really great. More of the same, plan. but uh, more of the that, same. That, but that Milky Way <laughs> sounds like it's really going to be exciting. I hope so, and I'm going to put the "Let's Draw the Moon" video on the YouTube channel when it's finished with the Mayo Science and Technology Festival. I'll, I'm just going to throw it out there and see what people okay. like to to do it. Yeah. Well, I, I have a question. Do, sure. Do you the, the the Vatican telescope or the Vatican binocular telescope? Does anybody ever look through it with their eye and draw anything. No, we don't have <laughs> an eyepiece. We don't have the option to do that, sadly. Oh, the, oh. Neither the large binocular telescope nor ours. The one right. that does have that is the Bach telescope, the 90-inch telescope on Pitt Peak. And wow. I have heard stories of people who have looked at objects through that and just gotten blown away. <laughs> I can imagine. But no, ours was not designed to be used with anything but uh, an electronic wow. camera, wow. sadly. What wow. a, what about what about the telescopes um, in Casa Gandolfo? Those are much older. You can look through those, right? Absolutely. If, and, uh, you happen, we, if you happen to be in Rome. Yep. The the two telescopes that we have that would be really appropriate for that are the uh, the sixteen inch or forty centimeter uh, refractor dating from nineteen thirty five. Refractors give you a marvelous image and a marvelous contrast that you don't get with reflectors. The somewhat smaller, but uh, actually in better shape, Cartier telescope. We should be seeing if anybody was inter- interested in doing some s- drawings with those. Sounds good. I have done some drawing w- with the telescope in Dunsink Observatory, which I think is 11 and three quarter inches uh, refractor from okay. 18, 18 something, a Grubb telescope. Incidentally, that Grubb telescope appears to be the, not the twin, but sort of the larger brother of the telescope at the Riverside Observatory in Australia that Daniel O'Connell used before he became the director of the Vatican Observatory. We were comparing images and it looks very similar. Wow, that's cool. 
That's a wrap for this podcast. The audio editor for this podcast was myself, Bob Tremblay. You can listen to our other podcasts and read our posts on the web at vaticanobservatory.org. If you'd like to attend our full moon meetups live, join our Sacred Space Astronomy community also at vaticanobservatory.org. Clear skies, everyone!